Well, good afternoon, and welcome to welcome back to our uh, sessions this afternoon. I hope you had a nice lunch and enjoyed the lunch together. Uh, I was there was one question that I wanted to ask Maria Clara in the conference this morning, and I was always hearing that uh, Dom held the camera did not uh, did not uh, did not. Look sleep at all because he was praying at dawn no? from two o'clock onwards I said. so I was asking Maria Clara that does uh, Dom have your camera really had time to sleep no I mean he was a mystic and was it, it's possible is it possible that he was sleeping or he was not sleeping anymore so I if he was he had little time to sleep I hope he had time to eat so <laughs> So I hope he enjoyed food, and like us, I hope you have enjoyed food this afternoon. It's my honor to present to you the next speaker for this conference. Um, he teaches theology, uh, history, and ethics in the Catholic Studies Department of the DePaul University. At the moment, he is currently writing a book of his essays uh, entitled Blowing the Dynamite of the Church. Uh, he finished his PhD in theology and ethics at the Duke University and an MDiv at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, he has been awarded the Charlotte Newcomb uh, Dissertation Fellowship in 1993-1994 and was a fellow at the Center for the Study of American Religion at Princeton University in 1995-1996. to uh, Like uh, Chris this morning, I was at uh, a loss on where to find the informal introduction. Uh, I have just met uh, <laughs> Michael uh, like this month and I was looking for some informal introduction. I did my research and I would like you to listen to a testimony by one of his students. Uh, so uh, this student said, uh, when I visited other professors' offices as a student, it was always to ask a question about an assignment. But I often stopped by Professor Baxter's office just to talk. He had a way of making you feel welcome, like he'd been hoping you'd bump him. His office was always a mess of books and papers, floor to ceiling, and on every available surface, and certainly he had work to do. But he had, he had always made you feel like you were on top priority. It, he'd be in the midst of writing when I'd knock, and as soon as I walked in the door, he'd drop, he'd drop everything, show some books off and a footstool, and offer me a place to sit. How, how did you ever get any work done? If he was in a rush or in his way to the meeting, he'd say, walk with me and listen to your problem all the way there. Other professors went home, but Baxter was always available to his students, friends, and those in need. Uh, you, you got to Google it, and, and you'll find it. <laughs> so, Professor Mike, it's, there's no other way to introduce his talk. Uh, walking and talking, the walk and the talk. Conversation with Dom Helder Camera. Michael Baxter. That's such a nice introduction. I um, it's by Anna Nussbaum, a student of mine who uh, just gave birth to a baby girl. I'm going to be the godfather. Oh. Oh. These uh, these relationships continue. Um, uh, I uh, want to say where I don't know if Maria Clara's here. She's cut now, but I'm going to say it anyway. here. there. There you are, right there. Um, I was I was reminded it's been a, a year since uh, some of this went down to, to Rio and um, had one of the greatest times in my life. Um, <laughs> Peace goes sours and um, <laughs> and uh, it was it was it was just uh, it was just wonderful. Um, so it's nice to see that and everyone else as well. Um, I met Don Helder Camera in March 1988 at a Catholic worker slash Nevada Desert experience gathering in Las Vegas. 
Um, it was a weekend, and uh, it was planned in the usual Catholic worker peacenik way. Uh, Friday night dinner put on by the local Catholic worker community. Storytelling and drinking well into the evening. Uh, a meeting to decide what to meet about over the weekend. These, these are anarchists. I mean, they get together. It's awful. Um, <laughs> lunch, more meetings, uh, dinner, skits, score, storytelling, and more drinking and talking well into the night. Um, and then finally, the next day, the third day, a demonstration some 60 miles away at the Nevada test site where some got arrested protesting nuclear weapons. A ritual of civil disobedience going back to the days when Ammon Hennessy moved from the New York Catholic worker to Las Vegas to start Joe Hill House and took in the homeless, including the legendary folk singer and trade hopper Utah Phillips. It was a wonderful gathering of friends. Uh, one old friend of mine, Frank Cordero, told his classic story that he's told many times about bluffing his way into a White House press conference where he tried to dump ashes on President Carter in the tradition of the prophets of ancient Israel. But he put the ashes in a plastic baggie which had gotten moist, so as he reached into his pants pocket, he was shocked to discover that the ashes had turned into a gooey, mush, uh, mushy clump of clay that Frank then heaved at the commander-in-chief before a posse of Secret Service agents dragged him away, uh, with Frank all the while crying out against the horrors of the neutron bomb. Um, there were many stories like that, but the highlight of the weekend was a talk given by Don Helder. It was about his struggle to instigate action for justice and peace throughout the world. In the chit-chat after his talk, I met him. He was talking to Jeff Dietrich, a longtime member of the Los Angeles Catholic Worker, who was looking unusually deferential for Jeff. He's not, he's not by nature deferential. Um, I, was appro I approached, and at an appropriate opening, I thanked Don Helder for his talk. He replied with words that I still remember. It's easy to talk the talk. It's more important to walk the walk. I nodded and thanked him. Jeff and I, and he continued chatting for a minute or two until we dispersed for the next item on the weekend schedule. I knew right then and there that I was in the presence of a great man, indeed a hero for Catholics and others around the world, committed to working for justice and peace. I had first learned about Don Helder by reading The Desert is Fertile, which I picked up at a Catholic bookstore in Albany, New York, 10 years before, 1977, when I was fresh out of college and thinking about entering the seminary. I had learned more about Don Helder in the early 80s during my time at Moreau Seminary and the University of Notre Dame, especially from people, mainly Holy Cross priests, brothers, and lay associates who had lived and worked in Chile and other places in Latin America. He was lauded by them for being an untiring advocate of the poor and a critic of the unjust economic and political structures that keep the poor poor, for which he had been persecuted by the military dictatorship in Brazil, in keeping with perhaps his most famous and widely quoted words, when I feed the poor, they call me a saint, when I ask why they are poor, they call me a communist. I knew Dom Helder as one of the most important articulators of the church's preferential option for the poor and the many movements in Latin America and beyond under, associated with liberation theology. Silam, Vatican II, Gaudium et Spes, Medellin, the 1971 World Synod of Bishops, Puebla, and so on. This history, which I knew to be our history as Catholics, especially Catholics committed to justice, which is as the synod, as in the, which is in the synod of, uh, synod document, Justice in the World, 
a constitutive dimension of the preaching of the gospel. This history was Don Helder's history. He helped make this history. And he helped make it a considerable personal cost. This was not a history made at conferences or in classrooms or in weekend gatherings like this one. But in the life and ministry of a priest and bishop who worked with the people, a history made in the streets and favelas, in fields and factories, in detention centers and prison cells. All this was in my mind as I stood next to Don Helton. He was short, not much more than five feet tall. I could look down, I could look down a little bit and as I looked him in the eye. An unusual experience for me. All this was in my mind. Um, his face was wrinkled. He was 78 years old at that point. But he was lively. He exuded a sense of freedom and openness, which is why I suppose he had come out to the desert to address a rad tag bunch of Catholic worker peaceniks like myself. I must confess that even as I thanked him for his talk, I was of two minds about what he had to say. I say this um, to the best of my recollection, as the Watergate lawyers um, would say, to the best of my recollection, I had reservations about what he had to say. And to the best of my recollection, they centered on the extent to which Don Helder's outlook, for all of its radical quality, was nevertheless marked by a set of underlying assumptions that can lead to an outlook not radical at all, and that can be gathered under the label progressive Constantinianism. In other words, I had reservations about the ways his theological approach was too politically conventional too captivated by the standards of effectiveness in the this-worldly sense, thus too easily neutralized or even co-opted by the powers that be. I would like to explain these reservations in the light of the arc of Don Helder's life and work, and then imagine how my part of the conversation might have gone. Don Helder was ordained in 1931 and for the next 25 years, in addition to his priestly duties, he served in two capacities typical of the social Catholicism of his day. First, he worked as a civil servant in the Ministry of Education, both in Recife and later in higher levels in Rio de Janeiro. This was not as, it, not as odd as it may sound to people in the United States. In 1934, the head of the Brazilian hierarchy, Cardinal Leme, I think, struck a deal with the Vargas government whereby the church would support the Vargas regime in return for making constitutional provisions for religious education in the public schools of Brazil. Camara was dedicated to improving education in Brazil. Yet at the same time, he represented and advocated for the church's favored position and what amounted to a concordance. Second, Don Heller organized various Catholic social movements. At first, a labor organization in the Sierra Labor League, then a Jossist labor movement, which he shaped along the lines of Catholic action, then a nationwide organization centered in Rio to address social issues for which he served as secretary. Francis McDonough depicts his movement in these years, the 40s and 50s, from an integrist model, integralist model, um, which he intimates had fascist leanings, though corporatist may be a better term, uh, to one pattern after Maritain's new Christendom, which called for a careful and conscious embrace of Christian democracy. Maritain's political and social thought was cutting edge among Catholics at the time reshaping social Catholicism not only in France or Europe, but in North America and Latin America as well. In Brazil, it allowed Catholics to address the problems facing the poor by means of a progressive democratic conception of politics. And this, in turn, opened up the possibility of viewing the poor as genuine political actors. 
Don Helder's appointment as bishop in March 1952 placed him right in the middle of this remarkable shift in Catholic thinking. The following October, he attended the first meeting of a national conference of Catholic bishops uh, in Brazil and was there elected by acclamation to be secretary general. Not long after, he was called upon to organize the International Eucharistic Congress of 1955. And in this context, he also began working at the behest of Monsignor Mantini in Rome, the future Pope Paul VI, on developing a Latin American-wide Episcopal Conference, which became Salem. The sense one gets while looking back on these years is of a church awakening to its ability um, and power to transform Latin American society along the lines set forth in the social teaching of the church and carried out through various forms of Catholic action. It was a remarkably hopeful and active time. And for Dom, Dom Helder, it was also a time of conversion, a time of turning, so to speak, to the core. His conversion was sparked by an encounter just after the Eucharistic Congress of 1955 with Cardinal Gerlier of Lyon, who observed that he was a talented organizer and asked him, why don't you use this organizing talent that the Lord has given you in service of the poor? You must know that although Rio de Janeiro is one of the most beautiful cities in the world, it is also one of the most hideous because of all these favelas in such a beautiful setting are an insult to the Lord. And so, as Dom Helder later recalled, the grace of the Lord came to me through the presence of Cardinal Gavier. Not just through the words he spoke. Behind his words was a presence of a whole life, a whole conviction. And I was moved by the grace of the Lord. I was thrown to the ground like Saul as a road to Damascus. I kissed the Cardinal's hands. This was a turning point in my life, I said. I will dedicate my life to the poor. Accordingly, throughout the 50s and into the 60s, Don Helder threw himself into working for various anti-poverty programs. Low-cost housing, low-credit loans, and so on. But in the process, he underwent another conversion, so to speak. This time, from an approach striving to serve the poor through direct aid or charity, to challenging the structures that gave rise to poverty, justice. It was while serving in the Northeast as Bishop of Olinda and Recife that he learned that the problems were daunting and seemingly overwhelming. The entry of multinational corporations into the areas with their agribusiness policies, forcing subsistence farmers to leave and re relocate in towns and large cities. All the service in the world was not going to end the hardship and misery generated by these economic and political shifts. Moreover, the military coup in 1964 ushered in governmental policies aggressively committed to promoting, quote, economic development. For a while, Kamara strove to remain politically neutral, but it quickly became clear that he would have to side with the poor. This movement aligns with that of the whole church during um, Vatican II, of which Camara was a key participant, as well as the Latin American church's option for the poor that fully emerged in the wake of the council. In the post-conciliar setting, Camara went to great pains to denounce violence in all of its manifestations. This is perhaps nowhere clearer than in his tract published in 1971 under the title Spiral of Violence in which he identified three forms of violence. The institutional or systemic violence of poverty and injustice itself, which he rather unpoetically called violence one. The violence taken up in response on the part of revolutionary movements called violence two. And the reaction to this revolutionary threat on the part of government repression, violence three. None of the three are legitimate, Camera argued, hence the numerical labels, implying that they are all basically the same, all unjustified, although he did express sympathy and admiration for, gen for genuine as opposed to armchair revolutionaries. His main point was that violence doesn't work. 
It does not work in Latin America, nor in Vietnam, nor anywhere else. But then, what would work? Camera's answer to this question was a call for a gathering of peoples into a movement of, quote, moral pressure. And it was this effort to which he devoted himself throughout the 70s, trying to generate a movement called Action for Justice and Peace. Spiral of Violence is a clarion call for the World War movement, worldwide movement for nonviolent social change, directed at what Kamara calls the Abrahamic minorities, those who are on the margins of society, and especially directed at the young. This was very much in line with the spirit of the times, during which young people were often imagined as the hope for the future. And this was the vision he conveyed in his talk in the desert. If only we could get enough people together to enact real social change. If only we could organize the discontent into concerted action for justice and peace. If only we marshaled energy to challenge the warring nation states of the world and change the economic structures of advanced capitalism. If only. Well, I think I could stop here and say that I hope that the story I have sketched out here of his life and work and thinking is fair and accurate. And I hope my sketch of his remarks is, is not too far off the mark. In any case, I would like to offer a sense of the reservations I harbored about his talk back then. In 1987 and 1988, I was living and working in Andre House, a Catholic worker type community in Phoenix that John Fitzgerald and I had started three years before as members of Holy Cross, a religious order. We were taking in a dozen or so homeless men and women into our two houses each night, serving about 600 meals six nights a week to folks on the street, with a staff or corps of eight, plus more than 100 regular volunteers. We relied on personal donations, no money from church or state. We took the Catholic worker approach to the problem of homelessness in Phoenix, direct service, charity, voluntary poverty, not focused on changing structures or reforming the state or federal government. An approach that Peter Morin dubbed personalism and Dorothy Day called in her more provocative moods, anarchism. I used to explain our approach by recalling one time when the chairman of the Democratic Party in Arizona, a rather beleaguered fellow, because Arizona politics was as bad then as it is now, uh, this guy took Fitz and me to lunch at a swanky restaurant on the top floor of the Valley National Bank building in downtown Phoenix. It afforded a spectacular view of the whole valley. The mountains off to the north, the desert stretching east and west, the, sprawl, the sprawling city of Phoenix and, and environs, at that time the seventh largest metropolis in the country, spread out all before us. And far below us, we could make out our little house in downtown Phoenix at the corner of 10th Avenue and Polk. Our host was explaining the plans that he had for changing city and state politics in Arizona. And as he talked, I thought, I prefer taking up the city's political problems from our front porch down there. That is, not from this magnificent perspective of the big picture. I prefer meeting folks face to face, the old time hobos, the Guatemalan field workers, and the hard luck families, knowing their names, knowing their stories, knowing who they are. Well, having taken this approach, as my approach for acting for peace and justice, I felt Don Helder had too large of a vision, too ambitious, too susceptible to co-optation, co too likely to end in despair. Why did I think this? The answer then why lay in my experience before Andre House at Moreau Seminary in Notre Dame where I studied theology with Stanley Hauerwas. As many of you know, uh, Hauerwas is a proponent of recasting Christian ethics in terms of Christological and ecclesial convictions. 
of making, as he would put it, Christian ethics Christian again. Reacting against the paradigm of Christian ethics shaped by the two uh, by two giants in 20th century Christian ethics, H. Richard and Reinhold Niebuhr, he argues that the ta task of Christian ethics is not to transform society or to provide an ethic for America, that is the United States, but rather to present society with an alternative ethical vision grounded in the life, death, and resurrection of Christ and to witness to and challenge the authority of the modern state from that perspective. At the heart of this perspective is a commitment to pacifism. Rather than present Jesus' teaching and example as an impossible ideal that can only be indirectly approached in the real world of international politics, the affairs of nations and empires, as Reinhold Niebuhr argued, Howard Ross argued that, the Jesus, that Jesus offers a way for Christians to live in the world, a point that was made convict, uh, convincingly by one of Howard Ross's theological mentors, the Mennonite John Howard Yoder. But more than this, Howard Ross also argued that the main efforts of Christians should not be to shape U.S. national policy, which inevitably draws them into the conventional political paradigms, left or right, liberal or conservative, Democrat or Republican, but rather to form Christian communities that reflect neither agenda because they go deeper. As Howard Ross put it, Christians are those radical, odd people who receive the unborn, care for the terminally ill, refuse to fight in U.S. wars, and welcome the poor and the immigrant. In other words, people who do not fit into the conventional po uh, categories of U.S. politics because it has its own politics. In Yoda's words, the politics of Jesus. It is not hard to see a congruence between what Hauerwas was doing and what Dorothy Day, Peter Morin, and other Catholic workers were doing um, and have been exemplifying for years. But as esteemed as Dorothy Day was, and this is why I myself was drawn to the Catholic worker and found the theology for it, at least in part, in some of my power was. But as esteemed as Dorothy Day was among American Catholics, her radical social vision was rejected by the preponderance of Catholic theologians, in particular Catholic social ethicists. Working in a paradigm formulated throughout the 20th century, these Catholic theologians insisted that the task of Christian ethics was to provide an ethic for the nation, and that this could be done on the basis of natural law and by means of reason. Catholic social ethics should be public ethics, in other words, ethics designed for a religiously pluralistic society such as the United States. Indeed. The United States is exceptional in this regard, in that for the first time in history, government had consciously removed itself from the internal affairs of religious bodies and remained neutral about religious issues. This constitutional commitment to religious freedom made it possible for Catholics in the United States to flourish, so the argument goes. And it is for this reason that Catholics owe them their nation, so to speak, a public service public service in times of war, certainly, but also more generally in terms of citizenship. The key figure to articulate all this was John Courtney Murray, who began his theological career in the early 40s, arguing that the separation of church and state in the United States was actually in line with the deepest and most compelling of medieval political thought, an argument that no non-Catholic bought. Um, and who concluded his illustrious career by helping to write the Second Vatican Council's Declaration on Religious Freedom, Dignitatis Humanae. Murray was, in some sense, the U.S. American Maritime. He provided a way for U.S. Catholics to affirm both their Catholic identity and their U.S. identity, U.S. American identity as proponents of democracy. This could not have come at a more fitting time for Catholics in the United States in the mid-60s. For it was then that Catholics knew, in a way that they could not have known before, that they did have a place in U.S. politics. After all, Kennedy had just been elected a few years before. Moreover, Catholics were making them, their, their presence felt in national politics in a way 
that was unprecedented. What with their roles in the civil rights movement, think of Monsignor Jack Egan's uh, work with Alinsky here in Chicago, and Father Hesburgh of Notre Dame marching with King. In the anti-war movement, think of the Berrigans and others demonstrating against the Vietnam War. And in calls for greater justice for the poor and working classes, here think of the scores of priests, religious, and lay people doing community organizing under the auspices of the Catholic Commission for Urban Ministry, another Jack Egan brainchild. With this history as background, Dorothy Day and the Catholic workers Although they had been working for the poor and homeless for decades, now they were on the margins of the emerging Catholic national scene. They were performing charity rather than struggling for justice. But there were several problems with this Murray-inspired vision of Catholicism in the United States. For one thing, it led in almost all cases, and almost inevitably it seemed, to a reformist uh, agenda working for justice and peace. One of the most often heard and read quotations during the 70s and the 80s was that of uh, Pope Paul VI, blessed, blessed Pope Paul VI now, if you want peace, work for justice. But working for justice in the Murrayite vision meant reforming the political and economic system. And this meant, for almost everyone so committed, working within the system for housing reform, for more government assistance, for changes in US economic policy, for, economic, um, for foreign policy reform. For another thing, for every Murray-inspired activist working for reform on the political left, so to speak, an equally Murray-inspired activist was working for reform on the political right. This was not clear so much in the 60s and 70s, perhaps, but it certainly became clear by 1980 with the Reagan Revolution, which would never have happened without Catholics, who by that time and ever since have accounted for roughly 20% of the US electorate and have basically divided um, between left and right in those elections. Um, hence, the great battles during the 80s over the pastoral letters on war and peace in 1983 and on the economy in 1986, which basically ended, I think it's fair to say, in a draw, compromise documents. Uh, these divisions have continued ever since. They've worsened in many ways with which we are all too familiar, which leaves many people tired and worn out with the polarizing battles between so-called pro-life and social justice Catholics in the United States. And then finally, there's the fact that all these attempts to reform the system, alter the structures, don't really work in the way envisioned. The United States, I would argue, is a veritable leviathan, a vast imperium that is not amenable to far-reaching social transformation. And those who set out to transform it end up, with time, getting transformed by it. This insight, this Trotskyist insight, I might add, made me wary of large-scale efforts to transform the social order. In 1987, I may not have articulated this critique in the way that I do now, but I think I was on to the main gist of it even then, in 1988. And it was this that created misgivings within me in reaction to the talk Don Helder gave to the Catholic World Gathering that weekend out in the desert. In fact, my misgivings were most poignant regarding people that I knew and loved most, priests, religious, and especially young people at Notre Dame and elsewhere who were committed, the, who were the most committed to the vision set forth by Don Helder back in the 70s and 80s. Uh, Notre Dame in those years had many good people who had been to Latin America or were going to Latin America in order to work for justice and peace. I refer to those who had worked in Latin America in the 60s, religious mainly, who passed through the rigors of training in Cuernavaca in conjunction with Ivan Illich, who were told, go home if you think you're going to tell us anything. We're going to tell you something. Uh, 
and who went on to work not for, but with the people, and who provided them with more gifts than the so-called missionaries thought they had to offer as they left, so-called reverse mission. These folks then returned to the United States and gave their lives urging young people at Notre Dame and places like it to embark on this same path. Wonderful people, people like Henry Now, Don McNeil, Holy Cross priest, and many others who were working at volunteer services uh, in the 70s, which later, in 1983, became the Center for Social Concerns at Notre Dame. But I always felt that their vision of action for justice and peace, to, do, to use Don Helder's phrase, gradually, over the years, turned into a conventional reformist vision of social change, very typical in the United States, rather than the radical community-based approach to social change that people like Don Helder had envisioned for the favelas of Brazil, the poblaciones in Chile, or the communities of Des La Salas and La Salle. Part of this, of course, was because the situation in Latin American context was so much more dire and urgent, where the only path, it seems, available is to, to remake community, to remake community here and now, ourselves. But part of it was also due to the fact that in the United States, the hegemonic sway of the state and market is so much more pervasive, subtle, and effective and one way that this works is through the value we place on effectiveness, which draws us to work within the system to change social structures. And when this does not work, resignation sets in, Citizen even, cynicism even. And as young people become older and wiser, they lose sight of the possibility that we can create a new society, as Peter Moore put it. We can be artisans of a new humanity, as Bob put it. We can make our history, as Marx put it. In fact, this is the only way we can move, to draw on language some have used to describe Hammer's movement during the 60s, out from under the shadowy um, politics of paternalism, under which we all live in both Brazil and the United States still and into the light of genuine liberation. I mean, what I want to say here is that democratic politics is also paternalistic, and we suffer from it. Um, this movement involves hard work, of course, as Cameron knew, perhaps better than any of us. What with the grueling poverty people face, the repeated setbacks, the misunderstandings, the repression. But in Cameron's thinking, there is little, way, there is little in the way of intellectual resources to account for the arduous process of liberation, nor for its constant delays or apparent failures. At one point, Camera describes his frustrations in this way. If I may speak personally, he writes, I could mention my own half failure, which forces me to struggle on and offers me new hopes. I dreamt for six years of a large, liberating moral pressure movement. I started action for justice and peace. I traveled half the world. I appealed to institutions, universities, churches, religious groups, trade unions, technicians' organizations, youth movements, and so on. After six years, I concluded that institutions as such are unable to engage in bold, decisive action for two reasons. They can only interpret the average opinions of their members. And in capitalist society, they have to be directly or indirectly bound up with the system in order to survive. And although I now realize that it is virtually useless to appeal to institutions as such, everywhere I go, I find minorities with the power for love and justice, which could be likened to nuclear energy locked for millions of years in the smallest of atoms waiting to be released, unquote. That's from the Desert is for in light of this experience, which I think we can all appreciate, it may well be that we are in need of a stronger account of the ways in which the eruptions of true justice and peace in history are thwarted by the cunning dynamics of the capitalist market and the heavy, suffocating arms of the modern democratic state. 
Here we, we may be helped by two thinkers, one a philosopher and one a theologian. The philosopher I have in mind is Alistair MacIntyre, who himself wrestled with precisely these forces in his Marxist period, roughly from 1952 until 1971. The problem facing MacIntyre and virtually all respectable Marxists of this period, the non-Stalinists, was how to teach and form workers into the kind of class consciousness that could resist the temptations of abandoning one's comrades for a more comfortable, less onerous life. Marxist arguments about the causes of the delay of the revolution are manifold. But the real question has to do with what to do in the meantime to sustain genuine camaraderie among workers. It was in seeking to answer this question that McIntyre found Marxist understandings and explanations lacking in resources. At length, he turned to the Aristotelian tradition, where he found an account of, an account of the virtues that could sustain community in the interval between the onset of the catastrophe of capitalism and its eventual self-destruction. This setting is the um, context for the dramatic conclusion to Act of Virtue, where McIntyre calls for turning away from the task of shoring up the Imperium and dedicating ourselves to constructing local forms of community to sustain civility and the moral and intellectual life in the present dark times. With this portrayal, while this portrayal was regarded by most Catholics in the United States as unduly pessimistic, when set against the background of Marxism's failure in the 20th century to gen generate anything like a revolution ushering in a new society, it emerges rather as a vision of profound hope Waiting for another St. Benedict is not, for McIntyre, a passive waiting, but an active preparation for a new society, which it turns out is already here in our making of it. McIntyre has often been charged with being utopian, but if that is true, then he is, as he has said, a utopian of the present. All utilitarian schemes of effectively managing states and markets for the sake of future well-being are set aside in favor of the less glamorous and more arduous work of embodying the good here and now in community. The theologian I have in mind is John Howard Yoder, who, unlike McIntyre, was a pacifist. Not, however, a progressivist pacifist, but rather an eschatological pacifist. In other words, he was a pacifist for whom peacemaking would not work unless one had an eschatology strong enough to maintain the practices of peace even without the evidence of progress towards peace. <clears throat> the importance of a sufficient eschatology was made crystal clear to me in the summer of 1981, shortly after an academic year immersed in Yoder's writings. I was in Colorado Springs at the time at Bijou House, a community of Catholics and Mennonites doing hospitality and peace witness. And a speaker was in town by the name of George Zabelka. As he explained to me one night on the porch of Bijou House, Zabelka was the priest who, as he put it, quote, blessed the crew of the Enola Gay as they flew out to deliver, deliver the first atomic bomb to the city of Hiroshima. He was a military chaplain. He was obviously haunted by his role in the Second World War. And once retired, he dedicated the rest of his life to speaking and writing against nuclear weapons. At this time, with the arms race at its height, the early 80s and President Reagan suggested that the Cold War could be ended by winning it, Zabelka was organizing a march of anyone willing to walk from Los Angeles to New York, to Moscow, because they take a boat. And finally to Bethlehem. He was on his way to New York at the time. The idea being that, the, that more people would join the march as it progressed, and that by the time they were headed to Jerusalem, it would become apparent to the nations of the world that if humanity is to survive, the only sane option was to disarm and disavow nuclear. Now, listening to him, I had read enough Reinhold Niebuhr to think that this was probably not going to work. 
But I also had read enough John Howard Yoder to know that this was not the ultimate issue. So I asked Father Zabelka, what if this march doesn't lead to general disarmament? He said in reply, in a grave tone, with a worried look on his face, then I don't know, I just don't know. I think humanity could be changed. And although this was a real worry then, remember uh, the day after the movement, as it should be now, I couldn't help but think my, at myself at that time that this is a profound lack of faith. I mentioned this in reference to Don Helder Camera, simply to note that this hard fought effort to generate worldwide collective nonviolent action for peace and justice. Justice and peace. This effort, as all efforts at peacemaking, requires a strong eschatology so as not to lose faith or fall into despair or lose sight of the fact that justice and peace will have the final word in history. But if that is the case, as Yoda writes in response to Don Elder's writings, it must be our word now, the utopianism of the present. All of this, I might have mentioned, uh, had we actually had that conversation out in the Nevada desert in the spring of 1988. Perhaps this paper should have been entitled instead of a very brief conversation with Don Helder Cameron, mm -hmm. or a truncated conversation with Don Helder Cameron, or the conversation I've had in my head <laughs> with Don Hel Helder Cameron ever since, but didn't have the nerve to pursue, because I knew who he was. It seems to me that these are questions that, well, as I went on in grad school, I learned to pursue with a sophistication that might have led me, if it were a few years later, to say something like, well, I think uh, your practice is better than your theory. Um, but I want to suggest something like that. When it comes to this issue of eschatology, um, Dom Helder, was smart enough, gentle enough, encouraging enough, not to engage in deep theological matters, but to say, but to quit. The easy part is talking the talk. The hard thing, the more important thing, is to walk the walk. And I think who he was, he, he was who he was, because he knew how to talk to people. And more importantly, to walk with people. And if we had walked together and worked together, I would have learned things about him that I've only been able to glean from reading about him, in many ways, uh, in preparation for this talk. So I want to close with three things that strike me about him. First, he knew how to call people out of isolation. For him, the key shortcoming we must all overcome is self-centeredness, the word he uses. That ability we all have to organize the world around ourselves to think of ourselves as the sun around which everyone and everything else orbits, like planets in our solar system. Sebastian Moore uses the image of the human ego as a strong mag magnet that it rearranges the universe like metal filings, all oriented toward ourselves and our own little projects. He knew how to call people out of that with the ease and confidence of a pastor who knows his people. Time and again in his writings, he will mention a man he met on the street a woman who lost a child, a worker who puts in too many hours in a job that is drudgery for not enough pay to care for his family. And then I think, he knew what it was like to be on the front porch, like I was envisioning. He was a personalist. Um, secondly, Dom Helder knew how to organize people, how to make things happen at gatherings and conferences, how to turn meetings into events marked by true community. Even in that most stifling of contexts, bureaucracies headed up by clerics and hierarchs. It struck me to read how, during the 50s, he gathered young people into a community that remained crucial for him personally throughout his life. How he convened meetings at the residence of the bishops of Brazil during the Second Vatican Council and had the greatest theological lights of the council over to talk. 
It was that sense that he conveyed with us in the desert with his presence, both his talk one afternoon and in his walk the next morning over the line for which he received, along with Martin Sheen and a couple of us from Phoenix, one of our nation's highest honors, an arrest record for civil disobedience at the Nevada test site. Third and equally important, he knew himself and conveyed this knowledge to others that we do not walk alone. In one of his interviews, he explained that he was gifted with the ability, it's already come up, uh, to get up, uh, gifted with the ability to get along with, without much sleep and to get up in the middle of the night at will. His schedule was to rise at 2 in the morning to pray, meditate, prepare his talks, write poetry for three hours, take a nap, and then go to Mass and start the day, which was always filled with people. This time, alone with God, this must be what sustained him through difficult times of misunderstandings, opposition from church leaders and authorities of the state, the exclusions, the death threats, the long, hard road of acting for justice and peace. But he kept walking and talking because he knew he was not alone. One time an interviewer asked him, what's the part point of talking about Jesus today? To which he responded, because this man changed history. He is alive in history. At every step, I meet him every day. And I meet him in the flesh. He said, whoever is suffering, humiliated, crushed, is he. I am as sure of Christ's existence as I am of my own hand with his five fingers I can see and touch. I meet Jesus every day. And we are one, no doubt about it. Interviewer, you speak to Jesus. Does he speak to you? Christ speaks to all of us here. He is here. The Holy Spirit is here, almost tangibly. By baptism, by sanctifying grace, we are all made sharers in the Lord's holiness. And being holy doesn't mean having visions or working miracles. It means living by sanctifying grace, constantly mindful that we carry Christ within us and that we walk within God. Walking the walk is the most important thing. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, for that very inspiring talk. Uh, if there is anything that I have learned this afternoon, it's this, that the walking and talking with the face-to-face -face community, which in fact was considered like dole out or charity or reformist is in fact the most revolutionary and radical. Uh, I referred to the introduction which his student has written about him. He talks to his student, he walks with them and lets them share. In fact, I think uh, Michael's life also resembles that of Dom Helder. So if you have an example. In <laughs> Thanks again. So it's open. Uh, Literally too kind, but I appreciate it very, very much. <laughs> uh, let's open the floor to questions, uh, reactions, and further discussions. Or as Dan Berrigan says, we can just mind the light and be Quakers. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, please. Okay. Thanks, first. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a good comment. Compose a kind of radical dichotomy between being associated with institutions yes. and being engaged with people. Thank you. But it seems to me that one of the things that he did that was brilliant, that was part of this time period, um, was that he actually used institutions to engage with people. So the resources that he gained from these institutions were one of the things that actually facilitated these points of encounter that had the, un the unanticipated effects of those encounters were what led to a kind of radicalization. Yeah. And so I'm not sure that you can have this such a stark contrast between someone who works within the system by trying to transform it, but I think more importantly in his case, trying to engage it to transform people's lives. Right. And I'm wondering, what, I mean, is it just a question of either you're on the front porch or you're on the front porch? 
No, that, that's a great question. And um, I was trying to be true to what I thought back then, but, I, but I'm a more subtle thinker now. Um, but, uh, but let me, if, if I could address that in a certain way, and then you, I, you tell me what you think. Um, and this goes back to my experience in Phoenix. Because we were often criticized for doing, being a band-aid operation and not addressing the structures, you know? And at that point, I was exasperated with, with that uh, critique. But, uh, but I thought about it since. So, so here's what happened on our soup line where we were serving 600 and 800 people in that, right? Um, the third year that we were doing that, we started noticing something we noticed immediately, but started doing something about the fact that most of the people on the soup line were men in their 20s. You know, we thought it was going to be old timers, you know, have been on freight hopping for years. And um, so a few of us got together and said, we got to start, we got to find a way to get these people jobs. And people were coming to volunteer who had businesses in Phoenix. And, um, and so what we did was we started to mix and match the people that wanted to work with the people that could put people to work. And out of this, emerged um, St. Joseph the Worker Job Service. Um, and um, the, the, the original idea, my idea, was to, um, was to, to run a temporary service that would um, uh, not make a profit, but would use what would be profit to support people that are going to work, getting the clothes they need, uh, eventually finding housing for them, and uh, eventually, my, my, the idea was, in Peter Moore's sense, to um, make the encyclicals click, that, that, that it would be a, a, working, a workers run business. Um, now, it didn't quite go like that. Uh, it went the way of the social agency that mixes and matches people. But we had a whole scheme laid out where this could work. And I'm convinced it still could. And I, and in thinking about this, I. I think in terms of that dichotomy, which I think you're exactly right, it's too simplistic. Because I want to say, if this thing worked, and if we were putting it together, if we had a business of 50 workers, well, at what point does that cease to be charity and become structural change? And I think that it's really fuzzy in the right way, because these things are enmeshed. Go ahead, I can see you want So they were, but, but your point is that they were agents of their own. They became lives. agents through yeah. this process. I agree. I, and so I want to say um, I'm all for that. Um, I guess one thing that your comment makes me think of is the distinction McIntyre makes between practices and institutions. And he doesn't say that we should have no institutions. He just says that institutions exist only as a context for genuine practices and genuine community, not as um, something that creates them. The only thing that creates them is virtuous activity with goods and terms practices. So that, again, I want to say yes to that. Um, and, uh, and say that, that Don Helder was great at that. But I also want to say this. Um, we also have to be careful of when those things 
tend to fall apart, which which they do. But we were hearing that this morning, you know, like you can undo in, in a year what you've done for 20 years in seminary, let me tell you. And, uh, um, so that then we need some sort of horizon against which we can have hope. But I don't think that discounts anything you're saying. No. Okay. Please. That's a good question. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, I just I am wondering, and I would like to hear your comment uh, about you started and ended your talk with the Don Elder camera saying but more talk to talk but walk to walk. And I want I'm wondering to hear from you your thought uh, about liberation theology nowadays of a great time. Sometimes I feel especially here in North America, we talk too much yeah. about the poor and where is the poor. We are not walking with them. So I just wanted to hear you comment about that. Uh, when you look the the liberation theology in the 60s, 70s, 80s, have a whole tension with institutional church, like the preferential option for the poor, something very was tension. Nowadays, we don't have that tension, the same intensity. Liberation theology is also is not in a totally space, especially in Latin America, how it was back 80s and 70s. Uh, however, the church institutionalized the preferential option for the poor. In the in the liberation theology, I'm talking. I'm from Brazil, and again, I, I know yeah, yeah, there in Latin America. And at the same time, many liberation theologians of people are doing. The, they went to institutions, to universities, and they are there. They are not of the poor anymore. And in the back 80s and 70s, the movement was different. Like when, for example, just Leonardo Bob, when he came from Europe after his doctorate, he went to the north of Brazil to work with the poor. So the least both. Same with Gustavo Gutierrez. And now, uh, liberation theologians are more institutionalized. He is a working institution. And are not talk, uh, are talking about the poor, but are not walking with the poor. So I just wanted to hear some comment, because you, you highlight, in, in my sense, very important, don't have it because he, he was not a theologian in a, street, in a narrow sense, no, but he was living like the essence of liberation theology, walking with the poor. Yeah, I, um, I, it's, it's the question of my life and I'm not alone in this. Um, uh, it seems to me one way to think about it is uh, I, I think as higher education continues to disintegrate in the United States, that we're going to look for alternatives. We're seeing it already in alternative publications, you know, um, in alternative institutions and in alternative settings for school of, of some type. And um, like my, my dream is to, is to do theology from from communities that are, I, I don't want to say poor, because I'll never be poor. I, I, I just want but to be close and to have a sense. You like the Pope says, right? To, to, to know the, the smell and um, the feel of it. Um, and, uh, I, you know, part of this is the cunning of success, you know, the cunning of success. If you do well, you do well. You know, if, if you're influential, you, you get further away from your originating vision, and um, uh, and I guess so I could be patronizing and say that's so we have young people who come along and point this out. But um, but I'm getting old, and um, and I still want to to do this too. And I think that it involves different kinds of community uh, than the ones that we're that we get housed in in the university. You know, with the students and student debt. The great thing about universities, there's so many good people to teach. Um, but the hard thing is, is that we often teach what we think should happen, but we teach it, you know, and of course Dorothy Davis and all that stuff. Um, I think Pope Francis is right when he says we need a church 
that is poor and for the poor. And I think he means both those things. The first thing, too. Um, that, in other words, closer to the poor. Because you just see things differently and the universe is different. It's the universe is more um, alive with what Christ was concerned about. Um, Is that is that help? Uh, I don't know. It's it, 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 it's something that has to be done. Yeah. Uh, just a quick comment. Uh, Very quick comment. Uh, yeah. 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 Very quick comment because of the time. So I uh, just want to say that I am very much afraid. Thank you, for, first of all, for your enlightening contribution. Just want to say that I am afraid of. Uh, false dichotomies when it comes to understanding where are we standing in terms of uh, the grounds that, uh, that, that, that nourish, the grounds that um, uh, provide um, uh, uh, feeding uh, uh, nutrients for our thinking. So uh, it is like, like opposing the uh, practice of being with the people or being at the university. In my view, those who work at the university level, we are taking the university as a site of the struggle. The university creating knowledge which does not support the knowledge of the system, does not support, you see, so it is, it is the practice, it is our knowledge practice. We are practicing creating knowledge, it is a practice, it is a way of understanding. When we are there, we are tackling the epistemological level. Tackling knowledge. How do we produce knowledge? Knowledge that 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 influences our way of being, our options, our values, our, who we are. So I will not put such an idea of those who are the university, you're not with the poor. You're not with the poor, you're not with your friends, you're not with the social justice. You're, no. Everyone we have different places, we have different stages of work, we have different levels of work. And we belong to the university, I'm glad that we are there. And we need more people there. We need more people. So I don't want to go more along those lines because then I will not end. But think about women in women in the academy. How do you explain to me that in Mexico there are only two Roman Catholic women with a doctoral degree in theology? Only two women. It's a Tamis and this one here. It's a Tamis is Protestant, I'm Roman Catholic. We need women in the academy. We need more. Uh, doctoral degree, with doctoral yeah, degree, know. no. With, with, there, there is, I believe there's another one there, but I, I'm not very familiarized with her. But we need to think about that and think about all the many, many issues. So the economy is not a place that will take us away from the struggle for the poor. We are doing the fight at a different level. But we are there. Thank you. Okay. Well, last comment from Michael. I and we will have a break. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, what, in one sense, you're describing what I am probably always trying to do in our classes. Um, but I'm suspicious of it. Uh, because of the, the tendency to think that if we show students the right epistemological perspective, um, or if we give them the right theory, it's going to change their lives. And I don't think it's going to do that. Um, and it's, in some ways, not our fault. But like in DePaul and throughout the country, students incur twenty to forty thousand dollars debt as they leave. In some cases, much higher. That's the average. Um, now, this is a problem uh, because the students that we teach, like I teach, say the Catholic worker, if you want to teach liberation, feminist theology, whatever. Are going to leave and have to take jobs. The only the only practical thing to do is to take jobs where they can pay down on their debt. Um, and so, the financial situation that they get put into makes the ideals that they learn here um, unrealizable in practical terms. 
unless the institution is ambitious enough to spend its millions on paying students back the way the Department of Defense pays students back for service in four years, hopefully training them to be different types of people, not military officers, but people with consciousness in the right sense. But but we, we're fighting against powers that we can argue with all we want. And the harder we argue, the more idealistic it will seem to them as they go out into the world, and the more uh, unrealizable the idea will be, so that it's very typical for people to say, well, back when I was in college, and to think that those were adolescent preoccupations that now, you, that now we deal with the real world. Um, and in fact, this institution, no matter what ideas we put out, will keep pro producing this effect of making our ideas irrelevant. It seems to me that that's where different types of schooling, the different types of financing, not to mention different curriculums, becomes so crucial because only if, it's, if there's a concrete, realistic way to embody the convictions and the truths that we've learned is it gonna become self-transforming. Um, so I, I'm, I'm sympathetic with with the idea that you know we ought to invade the academy, I spent the last 20 years teaching, but um, but I do think that this is a problem. It's a problem that Marx was onto, and uh, I think it's a problem a lot of liberation theologians were onto, which is why people like Diego Lasalle didn't ever teach in institutions, uh, and and so on. So, so it's something that we I think continually have to rethink. I just put out the mic. That must be a sign that this we <laughs> cut you off. Yeah. So we thank Michael again, and we continue the debate and discussion at the coffee uh, next week.